Good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm, my name is Derek Burmel. I'm the artist in residence here at the Institute for Advanced Study. Uh, I've recently come to realize that advanced study is actually difficult to say because it has a st, st in the middle. St, st, a double st. Uh, and I, I realized that when I started doing these radio broadcasts with David Osenberg on WWFM, which we do once a month, um, broadcasting all these concerts that, that you see here, as well as older concerts that were recorded in the past at the Institute. And, um, and the first time I tried to say Institute for Advanced Study there. So I've practiced that. St st it kind of, you kind of do one on the down take, and then you rebound off the second one. So it makes you think a lot about what singers go through when they have to sing words to like... think about that stuff. Yeah. Or syzygy, if you have to say words. That's not really too tough, actually. It's, it seems like it would be tough when you look at it. It but looks then very tough. What strength, for example. Great Scrabble word. Great strength. Yeah, it's a great <laughs> Scrabble word. Uh, this is Timothy Andres over Hi. here, and um, and uh, and we. I'm the old guy on this concert for a change. It's a little scary, but that's how it is, you know. Get older. These past two, three years, all of a sudden, I'm the oldest on the program. Time flies. This is my third season here. Um, and, and it's a great joy to program these concerts. And tonight, uh, we put together a series, and I say we because really we, we kind of did this together. Um, um, Timo is a wonderful pianist um, and, uh, and composer as well. And so we, we, we had been playing some concerts in Los Angeles, and we uh, put this together based on some stuff that we had done there. And then uh, a lot of these pieces seem to somehow fit together even though that isn't necessarily immediately obvious why. Uh, I'm not even sure I could explain why, but they somehow feel like they fit together. Part of it is just music we like, but, you know. But harmony seems to play a part. Not just Harmony Ives, wife of Charles Ives, but also harmony, like the way yeah, notes I fit think, together. I, I think a lot of these pieces are, are pretty, they pretty much work by harmonic shifts. Well, what about your piece? The, uh, the violin piece? The stomp. Oh, the stomp. Well, what's interesting, I don't know, all these pieces seem to have a relation to each other. Oh, can you not hear? Too loud? Oh, you're too quiet. You're oh, too quiet. Oh, sorry, sorry. I asked, He's shy and I asked mighty. Derek about his piece, um, the one called Mulatash Stomp. Like yeah. how how is that how does that fit in? How does that fit in? Good question. Well, first of all, it uses the three of us, which is nice because <clears throat> it's one of only a few pieces that uses all three musicians here. There's yeah. also Harumi Rhodes, but she's in the in the back practicing. She's warming up. Yeah, as violinists are wont to do. We're composers, so we like to kind of hang around and talk, shoot the breeze. But uh, no, I think that Mulatash Stomp, one of the reasons that I wanted to program that piece was because I wrote it when I was about the same age as you are now. Maybe I was a, a like a year younger or something, but I just thought it was kind of interesting to have something that I wrote now and then back back long ago. Early period Burmel. Early Burmel. <clears throat> kind of mid-early Burmel, yeah. Um... But but yeah, we hopefully it's a it's a nice smorgasbord of music for you. It's mostly American music on the program, with uh, but we've got also Schumann and Poulenc, um, which I think both both kind of relate in certain ways to American music. Maybe yeah, that kind of I was gonna say, well, because the you have the French, um, the Copeland was very influenced by French music, so I feel like absolutely you have that yeah. association, and then. Um, one of my pieces is actually based on some Schumann pieces, so that I think is why we brought in uh, the Schumann 
Um, so and Schumann, you know that that whole kind of. Uh, well, of course, Schumann very strongly influenced Brahms, and so uh, the Schumann fantasy pieces are one of the first great works we have for the clarinet, written around 1850. And at that time, the clarinet really was not even standardized as an instrument. It didn't. It didn't have a standard fingering. Chart. When was it invented? Well, the first. The, you want me to really get into this? Because no. then we'll get no. really nerdy. But <laughs> I can say that <clears throat> that the clarinet. Um, the early composers who wrote for the clarinet really wrote for an instrument called the chalumeau. And we still use that word when referring to the lowest register of the clarinet, the chalumeau register. And it was a French instrument, wind instrument. It just had that low range. And, um, and then there were these early instruments like the basset horn. Uh, people, people were continually inventing instruments at, at, you know, in the, this period. The instruments were not standardized, as they are today still. But... Um, but, but these common instruments we know at that time weren't standardized. So you don't see clarinet, for example, in early Haydn symphonies or even early Mozart symphonies. Start oh, to yeah. see them later on. Mozart discovered the clarinet. But he, what he discovered was the basset clarinet, which is different than a basset horn. See where I start going with this. So <laughs> I'm sorry I brought it up. In the, yeah, and then before I know it, everybody's just... <laughs> in the 19th century, uh, a, a guy named Bame standardized both the flute and the clarinet. And, um, and uh, he was an instrument maker. Uh, and, and as well, there was Adolf Sax around the same time who invented the saxophone, um, as well as many other instruments that did not survive until today. Um, but if you look at old orchestration books, you see tons of references to these old instruments that don't exist anymore. It's a lot of fun to look at them and, and see these strange beasts. The Berlioz that, that, orchestration uh, manual. The Berlioz, yes, yes. That's Berlioz a has, Yeah, as is the Forsyth. That's a good one. Um, these, uh, a lot of these, the manuals written by composers, Berlioz, Rimsky-Korsakov, are a lot of fun to read because they're, you know, Berlioz also is a great writer, so it's just very, fun to yeah, read. Yeah, very colorful. Colorful and caustic at times. Um, well, uh, what more is there to say about this program? I mean, Ives being the kind of father a lot of people feel of American music. Interestingly, Copeland was a champion of Ives. Copeland was about 26 years, I believe, younger than Ives. But, uh, but he, Ives was very unknown in his day. He was, uh, because he was an insurance salesman and was, um, you know, doing his, his work as a, his composition as a, quote, amateur, unquote, although he was a trained composer, went to school for it and everything. Um, Ives, uh, Ives was always kind of an outsider in the, in, the, in the composition world and was really overlooked until composers like Copeland started to uh, champion his music. Copeland How did Copeland get into, through, through Metropolis or something? Well, it was Copeland, Copeland was always on the lookout for composers. Uh, and I, you know, I think Ives was a kind of a quirky person that people knew about but didn't take seriously. But Copeland thought that oh, his okay. music was, I mean, people kind of knew that he existed. Like Mio seemed to know that he exists and other French composers, but uh, it wasn't really, but, but he was somebody that, that wasn't really taken seriously because they thought, well, right, right, right. he funds his own performances and he does this and that. And, you know, we, but ultimately uh, he, uh, of course, now has become very influential uh, and is still extremely controversial as a composer. That's true. Well, he didn't make it easy for us. He's, uh, yeah, you hear a lot of very awkward writing in this piece. Well, and he was so um, simultaneously kind of caring and not caring about his own legacy. Um, so he would write and rewrite these pieces uh, year after year and kind of make it very hard to discern like what was what is the real version like what would he have wanted to hear um, which makes Ives scholarship a very um, it's it's a ver very fertile ground for musicologists because the, there's so much uh, left open to interpretation and I think uh, Ives also uh I mean, ironically, he wrote most of his music uh, before he was at age 40. Um, and then he had uh, several heart attacks in a row. And, um, and after that was much, much less productive. And he, uh, and, and so then he became much more interested in get, trying to get his work out there. 
but it was after the period. And this was all before Copeland even came onto the scene because Copeland was born in 1900. So but he lived he lived long enough to see kind of the beginnings of the real um, Ives movement. Oh, sure. by then Bernstein had picked up uh, the symphonies and yeah, and, and Lou like Harrison that. had conducted. Uh, the first there's a nice first. story actually about uh, Ives listening to uh, what was it? The premiere of the Third Symphony or something? Four, I thought it was the fourth. Oh, I wait. thought it was the third. Some, uh, Bernstein conducted this. Uh, I don't know if it was a premiere, but it was a big performance at New York. Uh, New York Philharmonic played his Third Symphony. Um, and he was too sick to go to the um, to go into the city. He lived in Connecticut, but he was too sick to go in to hear it. And uh, he he so he sat by his radio, and uh, it's right right at the end of his life. It's a very nice story. Yeah, uh, Ives lived in Connecticut, uh, Hartford actually, insurance capital. Uh, well, Reading later. Oh yeah yeah yeah. yeah, yeah the house true. in Reading. That's true. Yeah, in Reading. And and actually, uh, that you know, he was awarded the Pulitzer Prize uh, f when he was, I suppose, about eighty. And he, they asked him for a quote that I think the New York Times called him, and he said, "Prizes are for schoolboys." <laughs> <laughs> so that was it. That's all they got out of him. <clears throat> but um, I don't know. Are, are there any questions out there? Because we can keep just gabbing up here. But uh, I don't know how interesting that is for you all. <laughs> it's interesting for one person. <clears throat> Good. We planted her in there, but one, uh, one vote, yes. Are there any questions about the program or at all? Well, me, I was, I was going to say say something actually during the concert. Um, maybe we should say something during the concert so that everyone can hear it. What do you think? I yeah, sure. We, yeah, let's keep them in the well. These people showed up so early. I feel. Uh, let's guilty. keep them in the dark a little no. while longer. No, well, uh, you can always repeat it. What you could do is you can say it, and then we can do a focus group afterwards and see what they thought was most interesting that you said, and then you can just say that one make, thing. Improve my jokes. Right. Uh, right. Um, well, the f the first piece of mine, um, which is called "Play It by Ear," um, I wrote for actually nine instruments back in 2007, and uh, it was w with a group I played in in college. And then it kind of um, kind of languished. It was uh, sort of a hard group to get together. And then um, Derek asked me... Is that your me, no, 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 net? The no, no, no. <laughs> um, <laughs> actually, it was named after Hindemith, believe it or not. Who taught at Yale also. Named yeah. after Hindemith. Um, we're both Yaleys, by the way, and we, we, I know that's a dirty word around here, but we also, uh, we're both just discovered that we're in the same, we were in the same college. Same residential college. Residential college at Yale. Who knew? Um, so Derek asked, um, Derek and I had scheduled these concerts, um, so we knew we'd be playing together, and uh, so Derek asked me to arrange it for clarinet and piano. Um, so what I did was I actually... Um, tried something a little different, which was I, instead of like transcribing it literally note for note, um, I kind of wrote it down from my head, from what I remembered of the original version, um, and then it's kind of like playing a game of telephone with yourself, almost, because, you know, you don't, you don't know exactly um, some of the passages. Uh, it's more or less the same piece, but uh, in in some interesting ways, it's a little different, um, just because of what I've sort of filtered uh, through my memory over the years. Um, so I, th I I think actually it may be an improvement over the original because it's probably more uh, a little more concise, uh, and and clarinet was heavily featured in. The, the reason that I decided to do it was clarinet was heavily featured in the original version. Um, so I always kind of had it in the back of my head that it was really a, a piece about the clarinet. So I think it works pretty well. Uh, and then 
your other piece is, is based on the Schumann. Uh, right, I'm playing these two very short uh, piano movements that are actually from a, a much longer set uh, called It Takes a Long Time to, be a, to Become a Good Composer. Um, and that's actually a piece that I wrote to go along with the, Schum the Robert Schumann piece, Chryslerianna, um, which is uh, a similarly structured. Uh, I, I tried to write something that was similarly structured um, in that it consists of short movements that kind of make up larger units, and then the larger units make up the whole piece. Um, and and so the the title is kind of uh, it's a little bit of a tongue in cheek. Uh, title because it actually refers more to the idea of musical duration than um, I guess like career experience <laughs> um, but I, I like that it can be interpreted both ways uh, well I could just say for my pieces very quickly that the the Mulatash stomp is probably something that I wrote <clears throat> as a response or influenced by contrast the Bartok piece which I played last year with uh, Steve Gosling and, and, and Copes, um, two Steves. And that Bartok piece, which was written for Benny Goodman, incidentally, as was the Copeland Concerto, which we're gonna play a uh, version of tonight. Um, <clears throat> that piece uh, you know, had a real big influence on the clarinet repertoire and really kind of spawned a whole bunch of pieces for clarinet, violin, and piano, and in fact a couple of, spawned a couple of ensembles. And so now there's a whole repertoire of pieces for that. Uh, and I think my piece is just a, a kind of, um, I wouldn't say plagiarism of the, but I think it, it, it's kind of. It's almost, uh, I don't, I, well, I don't want to take words out of your mouth, but it kind of feels to me like your, um, your fake folk music, like you're in, sure. inventing a, a sort of folk music. Yeah. Yeah, that sounds that sounds good. I mean, I I think it's got jazz chords in there, which you don't have in the Bartok. But it feels um, much more. Um, it feels much less grounded than you never really feel like you're in a harmonic place of rest. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's it's crunchy. It's crunchy. It's crunchy. Um, <clears throat> but definitely the form also has this fast, slow, fast kind of thing, which the the contrast also has. And, um, and, and, and there's one direct quote from it, but, um, but I wrote it when I was at school, at the University of Michigan, at graduate school. Uh, and let's see, the other piece is a, a brand new piece. So th these are violin etudes that I've been writing. Um, I had a commission from Midori, the violinist. Uh, it was a kind of these joint commissions she was doing with Vladimir Repin, the, the, uh, um, the Russian violinist. And, um, and so these 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 were these are etudes that uh, that she commissioned, and I uh, I wrote. Although she, I only really wrote two for her, but I just kept writing because I was kind of interested in it, and I had several ideas. So I wrote four altogether, which is longer than what she had asked for. But um, um, so Harumi's going to play those for you tonight, and um, Harumi's a wonderful violinist um, who, incidentally, is from a. Family. I mean, her father was in the Juilliard Quartet. Um, Sam Rhodes was the is the violist. Was the violist for many years of the Juilliard Quartet, um, and so she's from a real musical family. Her mom plays. Her dad plays. Her sister played, but now works at Carnegie Hall. So she's like a fam music family, um, and we play together quite a bit in the Copeland House um, ensemble, the music from Copeland House. So, um, so I've played with her quite a. Uh, a bit. So those are our four pieces. Uh, now, do you, as a Connecticut composer, feel special? You have a special affinity for Ives. I do, and um, it's kind of something that has kept coming back in my career uh, in a funny way. Because um, when I was in high school, I I, I grew up in Connecticut, and uh, I had I got this idea that I wanted to learn the the Ives Concord Sonata which is this big, his second piano sonata is this big, like, hour-long, uh, very expansive, very crazy, um, ruminative uh, piece about the, about four um, New England writers. And so I, I worked on that for a number of years and, and performed it a bunch. And then 
I somehow through that, like people kept associating me uh, with Ives. And so I've, I've written like three, I've gotten like three separate commissions now where it's been the, the, <laughs> the directions have been like, we're programming this Ives piece and we want you to write a piece to uh, it's sort of a companion, either s same instrumentation or just sort of inspired by Ives. Um, so yeah, it's, it's allowed me um, sort of a, a great deal of uh, um, time to reflect on, on Ives' legacy. And I mean, um, it's it, it's it can be he he's like a very um, he's a very complex figure and his music is also extremely complex and um, there are many many different sides to it. Most yeah. recently, I've performed actually w with singers a lot of his songs. He wrote a a very um, a very fascinating and uh, quite uh, quite various um, book of 114 songs. And some of them are very traditional, kind of leader in the German art song tradition. And some of them are just like crazy. Yeah. And some of them are General his booth. sort of yeah. invented folk music. And um, but some of his songs, I th I think um, maybe are the the purest distillation that you get of his style. You know this 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 issue that you bring up of fake folk music. I, I like that because. Um, <clears throat> You know, as composers, one of the things that you sometimes try to do, and this is <clears throat> true with you with your Schumann pieces too, is that you, you, you. S I, it reminds me of of uh, something <clears throat> from Beckett. This quote of uh, "fail again, fail better," <laughs> that he said, which is that you are trying to, you know, you set a goal that's somewhat unattainable, or that's unattainable. That, you, that, that in its very nature is unattainable. And then you try to get there, and in doing so, for example, I, for me to write some Hungarian folk music, you know? So it's not possible because first of all, I've never been to Hungary, but second of all, I, and I don't speak Hungarian, or I don't know, but, but I know a lot of Hungarian music, you know, the classical music and, and, some, and some folk music. Um, so when I set out to do that, it's necessarily going to fail, and I know that. But the interesting thing is, what what do I get from that that attempt, which is a failure, but it's a kind of success within a failure. So that's that Beckett was. I think it has something to do with that idea that you know you're going to fail, but how well do you fail? You know, it's a kind of double failure kind of thing. You know, and then so in, there's a success within that. And <clears throat> one of the interesting things being here at the Institute is that, you know, I think scientists and mathematicians often think the same way because they, they, they often set out to get something, but what they get is not what they planned for, uh, but it's the, the act of trying to stretch to a place that is unknown or that is unattainable gets you, it does get you somewhere. It may not get you where you thought it would get you, but it gets you somewhere. So that's one of the interesting things. I, I find that in conversations continually about art and when, it, when I'm talking with scientists here, um, that it's a, it's a similar way of, of thinking. And part of the scientific method, so-called, which you know, is what it is, but it, it's kind of uh, is diving in. You know, part of that, that thing is, is to dive to a place which is you know, coming up with some kind of uh, uh, a theory about something, or, or not a theory, but a, a postulate, posing a question. Right. And, and seeing where that goes. Well, I mean, there's only a certain amount of planning I think you can do when you set out to create, um, you know, a work of art. And uh, I mean, one of the things that I find um, myself doing is planning. I'll I'll plan a piece and I'll be like, oh, I I I know I want this piece to do this this and this and. I know that I want this section to be, you know, roughly the, in proportion to this section, and um, and then often when I actually do the process of writing all the notes and filling in that setup, um, I'll decide that it's it's actually not right, and it, it you need to fiddle around with it. So, um, 
That's a problem with sticking to a plan. Yeah, a, yeah, I mean, it it's, it's kind of like um, much more malleable architecture. I mean, like, if you're building a building, you don't really have the luxury of saying, uh, no, that doesn't really look right there. I think <laughs> we'll move that part over there. Yeah, those people might fall out, but that's okay. Well, some, yeah. One of the things that yeah. are the, that's really cool about being a composer is that you can sort of endlessly fiddle around with these things and right. but it also the thing kind is of that drives that you crazy that the thing is that structure is important ultimately in terms of having a real language that's coherent and that's something else that I find myself discussing a lot when especially to talk with mathematicians you know that I, I there are a lot of mathematicians here who really like music and I think that what one of the things they like is the structure and the language that there's a kind of a coherent structure and language. And one of the problems is if you go off in a million directions, you still have to kind of come around and make make the piece as a whole something that coheres. And it's often, yeah. it often kind of defies logic what that thing is. But maybe not ultimately. Ultimately, there probably is a logic somewhere, but we may right. not know it's what it so, is all the time. It's so yeah. abstruse, you can't yeah. really... So uh, maybe in that way, we're more like physicists. Probably has something to do with time. Right, right. Right, time. Um, speaking of which, time. Um, well, I was thinking one one thing about uh, the, every compo oh, every composer on this program actually was a composer performer. Uh, that's something else that I just thought was kind of interesting. Um, Ives was a great organist, and and actually a Poulenc? lot of his early was pieces. Poulenc a performer? What? Poulenc? Was he a Poulenc was a great pianist. Yeah, yeah. Oh, In fact, okay. you can find some good YouTube videos of him. Oh, playing nice. songs with people and playing his concerto for two pianos. Um, <clears throat> yeah, he was a great pianist, and actually his partner, uh, Pierre Bernac, for many years, was uh, was a, the guy that he wrote a lot of his songs for, so they would perform together, um, <clears throat> like Benjamin Britten, too. But, uh, but Copeland was also uh, a very fine pianist and later years a conductor, yeah. uh, and, and uh, he had... Phenomenally big hands, supposedly, so he could reach an octave and a fifth, which is why there's some, some yeah, the there's <laughs> some really like he he arranged this orchestra part for piano in the clarinet concerto, and uh, which we're gonna play. There, are, uh, there are an awful lot of parts where it's kind of theoretically possible to play, um, but maybe yeah, not for any human. Yeah, except him. I mean, because he uh, had these these very big hands. There's, yeah, there's some pretty insane chords, and 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 like I also I have really big hands, and and like I think they're insane. Yeah. So. Did you play the piano variations of Copeland? Have you played? I've I, I've certainly know that. I've never performed it, but yeah, yeah that's a, a an amazing. Copeland, piece. when he was young, was really known as an enfant terrible. We know him uh, from you know Appalachian Spring and Rodeo, so we know the kind of fun Copeland music that sounds like the. American West, and he became famous for chords like this, you know. You know, things like that, these open sound. But actually, uh, in his early days, he was, he was, when he was 24, he wrote his organ concerto, and there was a review very which weird said... Very piece. Yeah, a very strange piece. He actually wrote it for his teacher, Nadia Boulanger, and, 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 uh, and there was a review in the New York Times, or New York Herald Tribune, maybe, that said... Uh, if a composer can write a piece like this at his age, by 30, he'll be ready to commit murder. So he no. was... I thought it was like Bruno Walter who said that. Maybe I'm... No, I think it was the review someone. that said that, oh, actually. Man. Yeah, yeah. But I'm sure he said equally unflattering things. Um, I mean, Copeland was known at that time, but, but, but of course, the, all, the, all the works we know, I mean, we, you know, just that are known in the canon are, are kind of... Uh, pieces he wrote for Martha Graham, um, and and he like Stravinsky, and 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 many other composers really made their name writing for ballet. Uh, the pieces that are best known by Stravinsky are the are the ballet pieces uh, that he wrote for Nijinsky and Diaghilev um, in Paris. So uh, Copeland had that same experience here. Martha Graham was his collaborator, kind of. Uh, um, uh, and really br brought his name to a much wider public. Uh, and of course, the music was, was much easier on the ear than a lot of his early music. But there's this whole other side to Copeland, which is quite interesting, and was a great performer. Poulenc, as well, uh, was, was a terrific pianist. Um, it's really fun now to YouTube, I love it, like to watch these videos of them playing. I mean, it's just fantastic. They could dig them up from, you know. The yeah, I'll, I'll have to look up Poulenc. 
afterward. Yeah. yeah, and of course Schumann was a great pianist as well. Uh, though he, yeah, he, though most of what he wrote was for, for Clara Wieck. Yeah, um, that's Because he ended up injuring his hand by, uh, well, he tried to strengthen his left hand by uh, using this weight contraption where he would try and lift weights, progressively heavier weights like this, um, which if you know anything about the, the physiology of the hand, um, you'll very quickly destroy your, um, I don't know, your tendons or something. Um, it just, it makes me, it makes my hand curl up just thinking about it. It's, don't think about the, it. Don't think about really it. It's a really horrible idea. Like, um, don't do that. Uh, I'm trying to think who else is on this program besides those composers. Uh, I have this here. I should look at it and just make sure we're not giving anybody short shrift here. No, that's it. Yay. And we're performers. Yay. Right. Okay. A any other questions? Right, we're really desperate because my mom is now asking questions, but okay, <laughs> all right. That nice lady there is asking questions. How did we, how did we meet and get to know each other? Well, I know, knew about Timo because when I, I used to run a program for young composers at the New York Youth Symphony, and... Um, and and Timo was in, or you you were in the chamber music program. Yeah, and, and I, I saw you of, play. I was sort of in the yeah. uh, in the the aura, though I I didn't actually uh, sit in on that. Program. Right, 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 right. He knew he, but I knew that he was composing. And when I was uh, going to the orchestra to talk to talk to the students there about uh, the program. Uh, people would always say to me, oh, do you know Timo? He composes, because you were composing from a, <laughs> quite a young age, as, as did I also, yeah, I mean, from a yeah. young age. <clears throat> Not everybody who's a composer, most, a lot of people come to it later, uh, but you, you started when you were quite young, so. Yeah, yeah, so seven or eight or so, uh, writing down little piano pieces. I guess I'm still writing down little piano pieces. Well, I was pieces. much more ambitious than you, because when I was seven, I found some pieces called Symphony Numbers 1, 2, and 3, I was saying, see, uh, I called mine sonatas, though my what my conception of sonata form was at age eight, you know, God only knows uh, what that was. Well, <clears throat> you know, my symphonies were for clarinet and trumpet, actually, <laughs> which is what I played and my brother played. So, uh, so I I didn't quite understand the gist of symphony either, but I guess I I knew that it meant instruments playing together or something. Uh, uh, sound. It's, it's a start. It's a start. sound together. Sound, right? Symphony. Yeah. So, so there were phony symphonies. What can I say? <laughs> um, any other questions besides my mom? Anybody else have a? Well, no, but so, we, so, but so, more so, recently. Okay. So more recently. Okay. Right. I so. guess we um, we both found ourselves doing projects out in L.A. Um, with this group, L.A. Chamber Orchestra, and. Uh, so I guess that kind of um, brought us together because we knew we were going to have to play something or other down there. Yeah, the, and, I, uh, I, I was their composer in residence for three years, actually coincided exactly with when I was here. Uh, and so I was going out there a lot over these three years. It, it turns out every year they do something called, a, you know, they, 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 they have a special commission that they do uh, to commission a composer. And so within my residency, my commission happened last year, which was... Uh, you know, a piece I wrote for their orchestra last year. And this year, their commissionee, I, I'm still technically composer in residence out there, but their commissionee is Timo, who is writing a piano concerto, right? For Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, Almost done. Yeah, right. And that's also, and so so they've brought us out there a number of times together. And 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 then, you know, I started talking with the, 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 the director out there. I said, well, you know, we might as well, if we're both out there at the same time, might as well be doing some gigs, you know. So so they started scheduling stuff. So we got to play at the Azerbaijani Embassy and things like that. We also played at Clarinet Fest. Oh, we played the Clarinet Fest 2011. Yes, <clears throat> that was Don't exciting. Forget. Right, right. How could Clarinet I forget? Clarinet Fest. Yeah. Um, the actually uh, that was an interesting gig playing at the Azerbaijan because they made us sight read the a piece 
by a great Azerbaijani composer. That, I mean, who they told us was... Speaking of fake folk music. <laughs> right, and right, right, that was some fake folk music. But it was also interesting because the piece itself, it, they told us that it was the birthday of this Azerbaijani composer. Now, we wanted to familiarize ourselves because we didn't want to walk in there and pretend that we didn't know who... But well, and This all went on like an hour before yeah, the yeah. performance. <laughs> we, we didn't want to admit that we didn't know who the greatest Azerbaijani composer because it would be insulting. So we got, of course, on the web. Because everything on the web is true, as we know. And we got on Wikipedia, right, or something. Or we, we somehow found out who this composer was whose birthday was that day. And we found, and it said, you know, this composer's birthday is that day. So we thought, great. So we memorized that guy's name. And then, and, and we were, you know, we got up to snuff on his life and works and everything while we were in the car on the way. And then we walked in there and we said, great, we know who this composer is that you're going to give us the music for. It's so-and-so. And they said, no, 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 that is not the, the composer. And then they gave us music by another composer. And they said, no, no, it's this guy's birthday. So I thought, both of their great composers <laughs> have the same birthday? But they were wrong, actually. But we didn't, we didn't say anything but we had to do a video with this it was very strange anyway it was and we knew whose birthday it was but they had the wrong guy we ended it was, up way over educating ourselves yeah, for this yeah. event yeah. but we sight read this anyway in concert it was Moral interesting of it's one of the only times never, I've sight never read. prepare yeah. we were ill prepared we were over prepared in one way and under prepared in the other anyway much more than you need to know Yes. How difficult is it to find an audience for the kind of music that you create? Well, there's a sucker born every minute, as they say. <laughs> Lots of different audiences, actually. Um, really different wherever you go. It's interesting. Well, the traditional symphony and opera audiences, I think that there's a real crisis happening there when you go to the symphony. Um, people are starting to make music that is... Uh, that you know, is heard in different kinds of venues. And a lot of this is a problem of venue, of course, and the price of tickets, but also, you know, just people relating to a certain style or, or music that's mannered in a certain way. And I think when you sometimes when you take music out of that place and you put it in another place, people have found a lot of interesting things happen. There are some venues now in, in New York, for example, but not just in New York, but all over the country popping up, which are much more informal for, for hearing music. And it's actually, yeah, I mean, I think what you're getting at is it, it's um, in many ways a marketing issue um, rather than like a music issue. I mean, like for me, a, definitely a lot of the music that is um, being written by people my age and sort of my peers, like I, I see very little overlap between that and like the traditional um, kind of like symphonic hits. Like I don't see them really speaking to each other much or belonging on the same program. So in many ways that is kind of, um, we circumvent that issue. Um, you know, there's also, there's all these circles that happen and, and some of them revolve around universities very traditionally, but you know, some are just to do with by city or, um, now much more online, people who have similar interests. Yeah, and what I happens is, you know, with any art scene, <clears throat> the new art is kind of in strange places and not always that visible, and there's undercurrents going on. Um, and then certain things kind of come to the fore, and, be, and but by that time, they're almost passe. There's something else going on. Right, I mean, once the, uh, the sort of big name, you know, institutions start taking people up, I mean... They've become better at that, I think, about sort of keeping their ear to the ground and you have 
you know, people like me or, um, you know, people my age, like, popping up in these uh, major institutions every once in a while, Carnegie Hall, Lincoln Center, that type of thing. And um, there definitely is a sense of them being um, kind of at the top of the pecking order in a way, but also, like, I don't depend yeah. on them. Well, also, you know? also in a sense, obsolete or or, or right, worried right, about right. their own obsolescence. So, so there's those there's, things. There's happen. a certain image consciousness that I think is happening on the on the part of presenters, which may be a good thing, but it's often kind of more of a funny thing. And many, yeah, it is odd. Many of them are co-presenting, like Carnegie Hall, <clears throat> trying to be cool. You know, so uh, for example, they're co-presenting these concerts with Le Poisson Rouge all the time, and I have a piece on one of those in February, and um, you know, it's just an odd, some of those odd like mix. like what? <laughs> like what, what do those have to do with each other, you know? Yeah, I mean, well, I, you know, it's, Le Poisson Rouge likes the cachet of Carnegie Hall, and Carnegie Hall likes the cachet of, Le Poisson Rouge is the old village gate, which has now been made into a club that, where people, they play all kinds of music, uh, mostly pop music, but they do uh, present contemporary concert music and every now and then jazz and you know jazz is facing the same problem incidentally I mean jazz has as rarefied if not more rarefied audience than classical music at this point yeah. and and it, and, it, and is dealing with a lot of the same issues uh, and you know it's 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 not you know it's happening a lot of mostly it's because people are most people relate to music nowadays through headphones or speakers. I mean, they're, they're not expecting music to be coming at them live. Uh, but it does have the potential when people do get to a live concert uh, of changing their life because, you know, it's, it's something that they didn't expect. But of course, in, in Europe, you know, uh, people are much more educated to go to the symphony and do this, kind of, you know, we're here not. Um, and, and in other cultures like, you know, like in, in Africa or in South America, um, People are, are used to hearing live music, but not necessarily classical music. Uh, so, you know, depending on which country you're in. But, of course, Venezuela, for example. I mean, it's different everywhere because Venezuela has this whole program that Gustavo Dudamel, the conductor of the L.A. Philharmonic, has come out of called El Sistema, where they're educating kids from a very young age to, 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 uh, to play at a very high level. And so that's, that's you know, educating a whole country... Uh, uh, I don't know about everything else in Venezuela, but certainly El Sistema works well. They're trying to make that work here. I don't know if you know if if it if it can happen in the same way. It may happen in a different way. Well, and I I actually think um, f yeah. I mean, what I was saying about focusing on the traditional audience is maybe a maybe a blunder. I mean, um, for me, I I find that younger audiences actually tend to be much more open-minded um, in, in terms of the types of music that they listen to. And, um, and, and many of my, uh, my most um, kind of, uh, I, I mean, m many of my most memorable like performing experiences have been um, these situations in which there there was a very diverse audience, and so that's something I saw happen um, certainly in LA with the LA Phil. I think they've cultivated quite a diverse audience, and um, and also strangely in Miami, where which is maybe not where you would expect there to be a big like new music audience, but um, but I found that there was a large and and very diverse one. Well, part of that is that orchestra is very young. The New World Symphony is yeah, very young. Yeah. So that's... So you do... <coughs> I mean, it's there a are these orchestra. big institutions yeah. and they they can make themselves relevant. It's yeah. it's really just like they, whether they choose to or not. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I think just in defense of old people, uh, <laughs> young people are very open-minded. Older people have a better concentration um, and are able to listen to a... Pe I mean, I mean... I mean, the that's thing why is that I only write very short pieces. What? That's why I only write very right, short pieces. Write very short pieces, right. Well, that's the thing. I mean, I, I also think that there, there is the danger, the danger Under inherent... 28 notes or less. Is, yeah, I mean, the, the, the danger is uh, inherent is that 
of, of course, there, there, there's this kind of dual thing going on all the time. There's, 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 there's a wonderful aspect of the fact that music is everywhere and it's out there and you can listen to anything from any country uh, you want. Uh, and then there's the, the duels. The, the, the other side of that says, well, yeah, but everything's available, but only, you know, if you only go so deep into that thing, uh, what are you getting out of, you know, surfing the web and, you know, finding out about 10 million things, but not going in, into depth with any of them. And so that, I think this is the, the real conundrum for a composer. Well, I think um, live yeah. music is where you get that depth. Sure. And uh, it kind of allows you to focus um, on one thing for a little while, which is uh, one of the things I really like about going to concerts. And it's funny, it, <laughs> what I was thinking about people um, being exposed to music more and more in recorded formats it's funny because as that's come to be the dominant way of discovering music, like it's be <laughs> begun to be less and less the way that you can support yourself as an artist. Um, so yeah. <laughs> it's like you make less and less money on recordings sure. and uh, have to perform more and more, and yet your recordings are like available anywhere at any time. I think so. yeah, the, the the real crisis that that. I mean, the big crisis to me that's going on may less be an aging audience or something, and 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 it has more to do with the recording, recording supplanting live music and 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 live music being devalued. But in a weird way, it may come to be more valued because recording has become so ubiquitous, um, and people may crave that experience. So well, I hope that's why you're all here. But you I know. think yeah, I think people will always continue to. I mean, there's a certain amount of charisma that one can have as a performer. And, uh, you know, the, I think the greatest performers one really has to experience live in order to, uh, to get the full effect. I mean, for me, like, I, I put out my, my first and only recording a couple of years ago. And um, for me, it's been much more like just a, a promotional tool. I mean, that sounds like I'm devaluing it. Like, obviously, I care a lot about this recording, but like, it's really more just to um, to make to to like say this is who I am. Like, this is the type of music I write, and you know, come hear me play, or yeah, or like pay me a lot of money to write play. a piece. Right. Sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. And so that's what that's yeah. In a lot of ways, that's what discs you know have become. That's you know you're trying to get people really. The disc is you know a lot of the, a lot of the things that it used to be to make a recording. It it has a very different type of value for a composer for sure. Yeah. Um, yeah one of the things I just like about this is just being able to uh, play with Timo is that there's very few composers that play on a very high level. Um, and that's a lot of fun for me, just personally, because, you know, having been in the business for a while, and then, you know, you just, usually when you're playing with another composer, you say, oh, well, the composer's going, you know, but there's, <laughs> there's very few. You can count them on your hands and feet, probably, the number of comp really composers who play at a high level, and so it's, it's, Well, I know, think one of the things, fun. um, is just that, and I certainly struggle with this, is, like, composers just have a limited patience for practicing, and rehearsing, right? And rehearsing. It's really true. Like I, like I'll. We I should have had I, more than that one rehearsal, you know. <laughs> just just now. Yeah, I'm I'm so burned out right now. It's like, <laughs> um, no, but it, it, really, like I I find I do burn out on practicing really easily, and uh, I think it's just, you know, you you got to find ways of engaging with music other than, like. I don't. I don't know what I would do if I were only a performer. That would be terrible. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think I would get really all geeky about gear. You know. Yeah. I mean, you don't really have any choice. Yeah. It's like you got to obsess about the tiny details of the piano. Yeah. Uh, but uh, but w what I was going to say about that is also I just thought it was interesting to to plan a concert with another composer. I thought, well, this would be cool because you know w he's gonna he's gonna have composerly ideas about how to play these pieces, which are different than performer ideas somehow. I mean, just, you know, we look at the big structure and what the piece is doing. And that's not to say performers don't do that, because they do. But there's something different when, you, when you're playing with a composer, you know, you stop and you say, 
well, why did he write that? Or I think, you, yeah, I think it gives you that? a kind of healthy disrespect <laughs> yeah. for the score. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, and, and 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 license for certain things, and you know, and say, oh, they would never have wanted us to do this, even though it says that. It couldn't possibly meant. Well, but, and you, you know. get to have a sense of these composers' different personalities. I mean, when one composer writes something, it can be, it can mean like the total opposite than when another composer writes the exact same thing. Um, so, I mean, you you really like if you took every everything literally, you'd just go crazy. I mean, like Schumann does this thing that pianists just love, which is he'll write a crescendo. He'll write to get louder on one note, which of course the piano is is like just incapable of doing. It's not a sustaining instrument. You can't Unless get you louder play the tape backwards. just yeah. holding one note. And yet Schumann writes this all over the place in all of his pieces. And um, it's kind of a puzzle. Yeah. So you need to think it louder. <laughs> yeah. Just like think. Think, think the note, yeah. I, I usually just like lean into the keyboard. Well, anyway, we're just about out of ideas here. Uh, is there one last question? If not, we'll, we should, uh, yes. What's interesting about coming to the Institute from my perspective or from his perspective? Oh. Well, this is my first time. My first time here. Um, I think you were yesterday. impressed by the cafeteria, by the, the food. Cafe I mean, <laughs> the cafeteria is very impressive. Um, um, no, I mean, I. Uh, it reminds me of being in college, actually, like like grown up college. Um, like you get your tray in the dining hall and you kind of look around and see who's sitting there and. But aside you, from the cafeteria, you sit down next to oh. someone and have a have a conversation about invasive plants. You know, it's That's it's right. totally yeah. great and random. Yeah, um, yeah I, I could I could get used to you know. You know, being here. as artists, I mean, I can just say just from being here a lot. There's artists. You you do get into this world of artists, which is kind of very closed. It's a circle, you know. And I think um, one of the things for me that's been very gratifying is just sitting down having conversations with um, with colleagues here who some of whom are you know ha, ha, are at the forefront obviously of 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 their uh, of, of research in in their field and um, and just having conversations that uh, you know sometimes asking them what they're doing or you know and just and it for me as a composer, actually, I, I have to say, um, it's, it's especially been especially good for me because I have, a lot of artists draw their inspirations from other art. I tend to get my ideas from kind of mathematical or scientific ideas. Those things get my juices flowing uh, in terms, I don't know why, but they do. Well, you so, were a physics major, right? I was, I was, yeah, I, was, I studied physics at college, I mean, you know, but, but I, uh, I mean, I, you know, so, so some, and I still read a lot about it. I, I read a lot about science and uh, math, you know, when I can. But I, um, I don't know. I get a million ideas when I'm reading, uh, when when I'm when I'm learning or, or talking. And I, and so uh, you know, now I've got Helmut Hoffer on my case to write a symplectic piano piece, which I'm not sure I'll be able to do since I don't quite fully understand what he does, but I vow by the end of here I will understand something about symplectic geometry. I mean, it's it, it's just that for me, it's very inspiring because I, I think it's because it's removed enough from what I'm doing that the process that I can invent my own way of finding a musical analog to that thing that's going on in some other field. And that's exciting to me. When it's too close, sometimes it's, it's hard for me to find that analog. I feel like, I often feel like the key to being a successful musician is to like not hang around other musicians too much. I mean, it's, it's unavoidable, obviously, but uh, but like <laughs> you gotta get out. <laughs> right. You can see uh, we're not too close here on the stage, <laughs> even trying to keep it's our a gulf distance yeah. between us. Well, anyway, uh, we'll we'll take a little break and uh, stretch your legs and whatever else you want to stretch and. Uh,
We'll see you, see you um, anon. <laughs>